Welcome to Ancient World Studies. My name is Dr. Raoul McLaughlin. I have spoken about the giant temple structures burnt at Navan, ancient Owen Maka. This archaeological site in Northern Ireland was a centre of ceremonial worship and royal inauguration in ancient times. But this is not the most famous structure that was burnt in Celtic ceremonies. The question is, what was the Wicker Man? The Wicker Man is described by ancient Greek and Roman authorities. The fullest account appears in the campaign diaries of Julius Caesar, who was responsible for the Roman conquest of Greater Gaul in the mid-first century BC. In this period, Gaul, Britain and Ireland were all dominated by Celtic peoples who shared similar languages, cultures, beliefs and practices. Caesar explains that human sacrifices were extreme rituals. They were enacted when a severe disease or a dangerous enemy threatened a Celtic nation with destruction or utter defeat. Caesar reports, As a nation, the Gauls are extremely devoted to superstitious rites. When they are disturbed by the outbreak of severe diseases, or when they are engaged in dangerous wars, they will sacrifice men as victims, or pledge to sacrifice them. They employ the Druids, Celtic priests, as the performers of these sacrifices. This is because they think that to gain the favour of the immortal gods, the life of a man ought to be offered for the life of a man. Sacrifices of this kind are ordained for national purposes. Caesar, Gallic Wars, Book 6, Passage 16. In ancient times, diseases were sometimes interpreted as a supernatural force extracting a heavy death toll on the targeted population. Its demand for victims could be appeased by offering an alternative source of death through a special sacrifice. The victories of an enemy people could also be explained, their warriors receiving the special favour of a chosen deity. This god might be won over, and their favour transferred by some great ceremonial act of sacrifice. As Caesar suggests, this could also be a pledge of future sacrifices if victory were forthcoming. For example, the live captives taken from a defeated enemy might be sacrificed to fulfil an obligation to a god. For the Romans, the most horrific and feared of these ceremonies involved a giant wicker man. This figure was constructed from a large wooden scaffold and given shape by a body of wicker work. The wicker structure probably employed the same wattle construction method that Celtic people used to build the walls of their houses. A lattice of flexible, rod-like wooden branches would be woven between posts or upright stakes to create a sturdy frame. This provided a dry, fast-burning material. Within the effigy, cages were constructed for the containment of captives. Perhaps the wicker man depicted a specially chosen deity, or maybe it was an enlarged emblem of sacrifice, designed to attract the notice and favour of the gods through its sheer size and scale. According to Caesar, the victims were generally selected from criminals who had harmed their community, and it was believed that the gods favoured this sacrificial form. Caesar reports, The Gauls have other sacrifices for these purposes. They have figures of great size, with limbs formed of wickerwork. They fill these figures with living men, and set them on fire, so that the men die enveloped by the flames. They offer the gods, those who have engaged in theft, robbery, or some other offence. They consider this offering to be more acceptable to the immortal gods. But when there is a shortage of these people, they will make an offering of those who are innocent. Caesar, Gallic Wars, Book 6, Passage 16 Perhaps Caesar feared that captive Romans might be included in these sacrifices if his high-risk campaigns in Gaul ended in severe defeat and failure. The Greek geographer Strabo also refers to the Wicker Man in his account of the Gauls. He reports, The Gauls construct a colossus from hay and wood. They place cattle in the colossus, along with all sorts of wild animals 
and even human beings. Then they make a burnt offering of the entire construction. Strabo, Geography, Book 4, Section 4, Passage 5. Strabo was writing in the Augustan era, when Gaul had been conquered and human sacrifice outlawed. His information probably came from a Greek traveller named Posidonius, who ventured into Gaul several decades before Julius Caesar began his conquests. Posidonius wrote an account of his travels, which has not survived, but the information was used by later authorities, such as Strabo. Perhaps Posidonius witnessed the wicker man ceremony in Gaul, or was simply informed about its significance. It may have been a rare occurrence, and the collection of domestic and wild animals suggests a special invocation involving specific symbolism. These animals might have included native wolves, brown bears, and dangerous wild boars. Planning and preparation for the ceremony might have taken weeks and involved the entire community. Some would have engaged in sourcing and construction of wooden scaffolding and wickerwork, while others hunted for the designated animals or guarded prisoners destined for the flames. Many other ancient cults burnt the remains of sacrificial offerings, but live burnings of victims was exceptional. Perhaps it was believed that the smoke transferred the offering directly to certain gods presiding over earthly events from the skies. Romans had similar beliefs. They often burnt pungent incense on their altars in place of animal sacrifices. When the vast spice warehouses in the centre of Rome were accidentally destroyed by fire, onlookers suggested certain gods had taken the contents as a burnt offering. The blaze consumed the sacred centre of the city. The wicker man combined these ideas of sacrifice and divine favour through immolation. But the terrified uproar from sacrificial victims, whether animals or men, would have given the wicker man a different character from the more usual ceremonies invoking the gods. Some elements of the wicker man ceremony may have continued in Gaul after the Roman conquest. This might have occurred as Celtic beliefs and deities were subsumed into popular forms of pagan Roman religion. However, these customs would have continued without the participation of the by then outlawed druids or the prohibited practices of human sacrifice. Further possible evidence comes from a medieval text called the Commentia Bernensia. This manuscript provides a commentary on ancient works, including a poem called the Pharsalia, written by the ancient writer Lucian. The Pharsalia is an account of Caesar's civil war against the rival Roman general Pompey. The first book includes a brief reference to barbarous customs practiced in Gaul to honour three Celtic gods. Lucian describes, Those who pacify with blood the savage, Tutates, the horrifying shrines of Hesus, and the cruel altars of Tyrannus. Lucian, Thessalia, Book 1, Passage 495. The medieval Commenta Bernensia provides a commentary on this verse that may be based on folklore or some ancient Roman account that has not survived into modern times. The author comments, They honour Tyrannus Dispater. In this manner, several men are burned together in a wooden vat. In Roman paganism, Dispater is a title held by gods of the underworld. The term had older associations with the fertile earth, which produced foliage and crops. In Celtic tradition, Tyrannus was a thunder-wielding sky god who shared characteristics with the chief Roman deity Jupiter and the Greek god Zeus. Tyrannus is betrayed on the Gundestrup cauldron, where he is depicted as a giant figure holding his distinctive emblem, the sun wheel. He appears on this sacred cauldron as a master of wild animals and winged mythological creatures. Could Tyrannus be a deity honoured by burning sacrifices? Perhaps the wicker man ceremony was enacted by other Celtic peoples on the continent. During the 3rd century BC, Celtic populations challenged the Greek states 
by invading and settling in the Balkans. Further Celtic tribes conquered and for a time dominated Pannonia, a territory south of the Danube, situated between Italy and Greece. When the Romans conducted campaigns against these Celtic tribes, they accused them of savage cruelty. The Roman historian Florus reports. When the Celts advanced, they inflicted every form of cruelty and insult. They vented their fury on the prisoners. They sacrificed to their gods with human blood, and they drank out of human skulls. And they made death more dreadful by burnings and by the inhalation of smoke. Flores, Roman History, Book 39, Section 3, Passage 4. There is no mention of the wicker man in this region, but possible evidence comes from the coinage produced by the Celts in Thrace. These Celts copied Greek-style silver coinage, known as tetradrachmas. However, they introduced their own artwork, imagery and motifs to represent Celtic gods, symbols and ceremonies. One of the figures that appears on these coins has been interpreted as a colossus with a flaming head. The giant often appears on a platform observed by a large assembly of people indicated by the dot-like outline of their raised heads. The figure could be the thunder god Tyrannus, as his distinctive solar wheel emblem appears on the coin. On this image, the colossus faces the solar wheel as it ascends through the sky. Often these giants are flanked by supports, struts and grid-like features that could be scaffolding, wicker work or ladders. Sometimes the head of the Colossus is portrayed as a giant sun wheel, and sometimes the effigy has outstretched limbs like the spokes of a wheel. One image gives the Colossus a box-like rectangular head which may have been a cage-like cabin or the frame of a wooden vat. There is no record of the wicker man ceremony among the British Celts, but it was possible that they followed this practice. According to Julius Caesar, the Druidic cult originated in Britain and was transferred from there to the continental Celts, Caesar reports. The Druidic institution is supposed to have been devised in Britain and to have been brought over from there to Gaul, and now those who desire to gain a more accurate knowledge of that system generally go to Britain to study it. Caesar, Gallic Wars, Book 6, Passage 13 No archaeological trace of these vast cremations has ever been found, and the Romans would have placed swift prohibitions on human sacrifice once they conquered the territory. The earliest Irish traditions do not preserve any obvious reference to this ceremony, and perhaps it was never practised in ancient Ireland. Perhaps the Irish had other ceremonies to invoke their protector gods. Archaeologists who excavated the high mound at Navan discovered the remains of a vast circular building supported by giant oak pillars. This wooden temple was 40 metres, or 120 feet in diameter, meaning that it was the largest building in northern Europe at the time of its construction. The temple was ceremonially destroyed soon after its construction in 95 BC. This was achieved by filling the interior of the building with limestone rocks in a radial shape, replicating the outline of the solar sky wheel. When the rocks were stacked above head height, the upper part of the building was packed with thatch kindling. Then the entire construction was burnt. A signal was sent to the god that was larger and more impressive than the burning effigies ignited by the continental Celts. And it is here that Celtic culture has endured and still has its strongest resonance. Please like and share this video, and if you are interested in the Celts, view my video lecture on Owen Macha, the capital of ancient Ulster. Thank you for your attention.